Hi, this is Dr. Mahendran, Forensic Medicine and Toxicology Faculty of Repladder. Here with us, Dr. Sonu Ponwar, sir, Microbiology Faculty of Repladder. Here we are with one more important topic, uh, essential topic, that is food poisoning. We'll be discussing about the signs and symptoms, the presentation of various food poisons and how to diagnose it and what are the duties of a doctor in such cases, right? So let us hand over it to sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, as sir told, this is a very high yield topic regarding the food poisoning and all. And uh, before going off into the deep uh, with the various charts, with flow charts and all, we should know what is food poisoning. Okay. So first of all, what is food poisoning? Food poisoning refers to an illness acquired through consumption of food or drink, obviously that is contaminated either with the microorganisms or their toxins. So this is what is the like definition of food poisoning. Illness acquired through consumption of food or drink which is contaminated either with the microorganisms or their toxins. Sir, if uh, is there any difference in incubation period when a person is taking microorganism as such or the toxin as such? Is there any difference in the incubation period? Yeah, there is and uh, this is what I is going to tell with this particular table. Yes. Okay. So, in this particular table, as you can see that uh, from 1 to 6 hours, this particular two organisms like one is Staph aureus and Bacillus cereus. These are the important ones which associates with this incubation period because this is itself a question, frequently asked question, okay, yes. regarding this one to six hours that which organisms are there in that. So two names you need to remember. One is Staph aureus and another one is Bacillus cereus. Yes. And this Bacillus cereus one is which one? That is the emetic one. So emetic means what? Basically vomiting will be more prominent here but it is not so that diarrhea will not be there diarrhea can also be there but vomiting will be more predominant, predominant. sir but uh, both the staph aureus and bacillus cereus both are causing same symptom nausea vomiting diarrhea but how to differentiate because both have similar kind of incubation period as well and the symptoms are also same symptoms also same so this is a very re relevant question you have asked so in that what you need to remember is you should ask for the food source that what they have eaten up before this particular thing happening so that will help up to okay. differentiate up. Like in the staph aureus, it is regarding this ham, that's pork and all, poultry, potato salad, egg salad, and mayonnaise and pastries. Okay, so basically contaminated meat and milk mostly, but yes, regarding the potato also. Okay. And this is uh, regarding the characteristic history of Chinese fried rice. Okay, okay. and that too from uh, Gautam Nagar and all. Okay, which one? Like a reheated one, reheated Chinese fried rice. Again and again, like it is being reheated. Now you will say yes, that it is reheated, but still it is not going off this toxin and all because this is a heat stable toxin. Heat stable. Hmm. So Staph aureus and Bacillus cereus one, both they are having what? Heat stable one. Yes. Okay. This is also having heat stable. This is also having heat stable. If it is formed once, obviously it's a preformed toxin. Yes. If it is formed once, then you have to throw the food. Yes. You can't have it. Okay. Now the another one regarding the incubation period is regarding this 8 to 16 hours. And in this, Again, two organisms important. One is Clostridium perfringens, which is also termed as Clostridium vulci, and Bacillus cereus. Again, it have come, but this one is the diarrheal strain. Okay, this one is the diarrheal strain, and the symptoms of both they are same: abdominal cramps along with diarrhea. Okay, vomiting can also happen, so they can confuse you by giving up all the features, vomiting and all. Don't try to look out for emetic and diarrhea. The emetic will have only vomiting, or diarrheal will have only diarrhea. They can have both vomiting and diarrhea, so that is also there. And regarding the food source and all, so this is beef, poultry, legumes and gravies for Clostridium perfringens. And regarding this meat, vegetables, dried beans and cereals, so that is there. And mixed stuff can also be there. Okay. So this is regarding the 8 to 16 hours. And now coming to the more than 16 hours stuff, that is uh, number of organisms are there. Firstly, the name of them. One is Vibrio cholerae, Anterotoxigenic E. coli, Anterohemorrhagic E. coli, Salmonella species. Compilobacter jujuni, Shigella, Vibrio, Parahemolyticus. These are the various ones which are having more than 16 hours. Okay. In fact, you can put Clostridium botulinum also in this particular category. It is also having more than 16 hours, this particular one. Okay. So let's talk about more than 16 hours regarding the Vibrio cholerae first. So everybody knows that it is having what? A what? Watery diarrhea stuff. Okay. And if it is pertaining to the foods and all, these are in also involved up as per the table, shellfish, which is a seafood and these water, contaminated water, obviously with the stool sample and all that will lead to this particular thing, infection, Vibrio cholerae. So there was one more thing that shellfish, it also produces associated with another toxin that is saxitoxin. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is another toxin which is associated with selfish uh, consumption. The person will present with GAT symptoms and ataxia as well. Okay, okay, okay. That's a good point you told. Saxi toxin. Okay. Then the next one, as you know, guys, enterotoxinic E. coli. That is a most common causal agent of what travelers diarrhea. Okay. okay. So those particular foreigners which comes to India from America okay. and from UK and all, they tend to develop this watery diarrhea by having our pure water also okay <laughs> so that can tell that uh, how much pure water we have okay and that that is also like uh, told to be a reason that why covid 19 is not causing so much of yes, deaths in yes, india yes okay we have, we have more immunity yeah exactly all sorts of antibodies we have by having these contaminated water and all that stuff okay so enterotoxin e coli with salads cheese meat water these are there and this is the most common cause of travelers diarrhea how to remember that t for t okay then enter hemorrhage E. coli. This leads to this bloody diarrhea stuff. And as you know that this is the most common zero group O157H7 which associates with this. And these are the organisms enter hemorrhage E. coli. These are the stuffs which after eating up can have this infection enter hemorrhage E. coli 1. This ground beef that is a minced beef, salami that is pork, raw milk, raw vegetables and the apple juice. And how to like remember this? Like apple juice looks like what? Like a red color. Red, red color, color one. Okay. So red color one. So this is, uh, this zero group is also being asked guys. O157H7. Okay. And that which hemorrhagic, obviously the name hemorrhagic, it means like it's bloody. Obviously, yeah. obviously. And from this apple juice also. Okay. You can remember this. And Sarav uh, rightly told that hemorrhage stuff is there. So this is bloody, bloody stuff. Bloody. Okay. Another important equalized stuff it is. Enterohemorrhagic one. Fine. A lot of questions are there like uh, which type of toxin is released. Okay. So you know that, that there is a virotoxin which is there VT1, VT2. Okay. And uh, those are responsible for the features of this enterohemorrhagic E. coli. And the mechanism of this enterotoxinic and enterohemorrhagic is like uh, they increase up that uh, cyclic uh, AMP, cyclic GMP, all that stuff. Okay. Regarding the Salmonella and Shigella or Campylobacter jejuni. So these are like sort of an inflammatory form of diarrhea or dysentery. Okay. So what is the meaning of this inflammatory form of diarrhea? So basically there is an inflammation and because there's inflammation, like uh, these all features, they come in that. The Salmonella species, it is inflammatory diarrhea and the organ, this particular food material which is concerned with them is what? The beef, the poultry, the eggs and the dairy products. And remember this, this is not Salmonella typhi. This is non-Salmonella typhi. Which one? Salmonella typhi murium, yes. Salmonella enteritis, all those stuffs. So they are termed as what? Non-Salmonella typhi. They are concerned with causing up this inflammatory diarrhea. Even the Salmonella typhi also does it, but that is not having these type of histories, like having these and all. So this is regarding mainly regarding the non-Salmonella typhi stuff. Beef, poultry, eggs and dairy products. Fine. What is the difference between this pathophiasis in uh, watery diarrhea and inflammatory diarrhea? Sir? So this is uh, obviously good question. This is obviously due to what the toxin and all the toxin. And uh, this particular one is having the inflammation. inflammation. So and uh, the stools would be uh, uh, mucoid. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, the important point in the lab diagnosis of it, which we'll discuss later, is uh, like in this inflammatory form, you have to look out for the fecal leukocytes. Okay, okay. that is very characteristic in that. Whereas this is due to the toxin, so you have to go for toxin demonstration and all other features. Yes. Okay. So Campylobacter jejuni, another favorite question of examiner, which is a gullwing shaped bacteria. Okay. It also associates with inflammatory diarrhea. Okay. And they will give a history of poultry or raw milk and all. And uh, important regarding Campylobacter jejuni is that it also associates GBS. GBS. Okay. Gullian virus syndrome. This particular one associates one and frequently asked question this is. Okay, for this particular one and along with that, I've just told you another hint, fecal leukocytes. That will also come in that. Regarding the Shigella, you know this is the most common cause of this dysentery and worldwide it is Shigella Sony and in India it is Shigella Flexionary, which causes this particular dysentery like episodes. That is a bloody diarrhea. Okay, and uh, the this food stuff is potato, egg salad, lettuce, that sandwich and all and raw vegetables. Okay, so that is regarding the Shigella. Vibrio parahemolyticus, this also presents up with the dysentric episodes and all. And the seafoods are involved with this, that is the mollusk and crustaceans. And this Vibrio parahemolyticus is a sort of a halophilic Vibrio. Okay. okay, it needs a high amount of salt to survive. So Vibrio parahemolyticus is a halophilic one associated with seafood poisoning. Another frequently asked question. And it is having characteristically 16 to 24 hours of incubation period. Okay, and mollusk and crustaceans are involved in this. And uh, this particular one is a halophilic stuff. So this is the table guys out of which 
definitely one or two questions are there and these all points will be asked in some scenario form or some other form that this particular uh, fellow have eaten up this landed up with this so this type of co questions will come in the integration fashion okay regarding the incubation period they can ask you the symptoms and all okay and the sir have uh, rightly asked up that how to differentiate sir watery diarrhea from this inflammatory one so you have to look out for those fecal leukocytes so if the question is telling again and again regarding fecal leukocytes then you should immediately like rule out vibrio enterotoxigenic and all you should focus upon those which can, does this inflammatory form of diarrhea so this is the way to like uh, catch up the things to like read up the things fine now let's talk about this also that is botulism and uh, as you know that botulism obviously is done by whom clostridium botulinum yes. okay which is uh, like producing lot of urotoxins only one particular c2 is there which is the anti urotoxin otherwise it is producing most of the neurotoxins okay that is the most dangerous toxin in the world yeah 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 it is the most potent toxin in most earth potent. some says but it does not mean that every neurotoxin will kill okay but some are there which definitely kills and it is found to be the most potent toxin on earth that is the botulinum toxin okay and uh, out of which that uh, clostridium botulinum a b and e these zero types of it they cause most of the infections and as you know that it is having a food borne botulism that is canned food poisoning yes. okay the infant also develops this infant botulism yes. due to the honey and all and wound botulism is also there okay so this is the mechanism guys by which this manifestation of botulism they come that is due to the decrease acetylcholine remember this particular point this was asked in the exam there is a decrease in the acetylcholine okay and because of discrete acetylcholine in the cranial nerves and the parasympathetic nerve terminals all the features they come okay and uh, see here the incubation period is 18 to 36 hours of this particular one and the features like uh, if i talk about the canned food poisoning and all what is there diplopia dysphagia dysarthria misarticulation of word double vision and characteristically this can also be found that is a flaccid paralysis of the voluntary muscles okay the flaccid paralysis and that is descending a symmetric flaccid paralysis of the voluntary muscle along with that you can have like decreased dtr deep tendon reflexes are also decreased off okay so all those features if they are given in the question then you should think obviously like uh, after the history of that food ingestion or some other thing okay so this flaccid paralysis is of paramount importance in the case of uh, this particular syndrome that is termed as floppy infant syndrome okay so sir what uh, like uh, ritual we have uh, in our north side that uh, to a newborn we try to give up honey okay okay and that particular honey basically we give that uh, more activity yes. does more active it becomes but nobody notices up that where that honey is being kept for months together okay okay so what can be there in that honey the spores the spores, spores of clostridium botulinum infantile yeah and the infants they are very susceptible for that okay so they tend to develop this particular thing that is floppy infant syndrome which is actually the flaccid paralysis it also termed as floppy child syndrome or floppy infant syndrome okay basically it is a flaccid paralysis in them also okay so better avoid in the infants what yes. these uh, honey and all. exclusive breastfeeding yeah better so there is one more point to add in flaccid paralysis when we are talking about flaccid paralysis i am just reminded of another fact that uh, even the neurotoxic snake bites they can also cause uh, descending flaccid paralysis initially okay. it start with ptosis again here it starts with ptosis diplopia similarly uh, a cobra bite patient or a crate bite patient they will also present with descending flaccid paralysis as sir was, sir was telling you need to look for the history as well exactly right if the patient is coming from uh, coming from a village and he is coming with history of snake bite and he is presenting with descending flaccid paralysis you obviously uh, think of like neuro neurotoxic envenomation right okay. or if the person is uh, uh, not having any kind of this snake bite or if he is having any history of contaminated food intake then you should obviously think of for this bottle you need to have this mind this thing in mind so that you can you'll be able to differentiate uh, whether the person is suffering from botulism or uh, neurotoxic envenomation because the treatment will obviously vary in these two situations so this tells the importance of taking history sir definitely sir mm. definitely detailed history taking is highly highly important now the sir will tell regarding the other very important toxins which are very high yield and frequently asked and uh, for that uh, i pass on to the battle to the so thank you sir
So let us start with uh, one more important uh, food that is Lethera sativus. Uh, you must be knowing that it is called Kesari Dal, it is called Indian Pea or Grass Pea. There are various names for it. Consumption of this particular seed, right? It causes one important condition that is called Lethairism. Lethairism. Because this particular seed will be having one important uh, toxin that is beta oxalyl amino alanine. Right. This particular toxin is uh, highly uh, accumulated in the seeds. But you see, every part of the plant is having this toxin. But particularly in the seed, this is concentrated. When a person is having this kesari doll uh, for more than six months, when the total intake is more thirty percent of the total diet, and he is having it for a period of six months, the person will be suffering from this kind of symptom that is lethargism. The one of the most uh, clinching uh, feature of this particular uh, condition is spastic paraplegia. Sir, we were talking about flaccid paralysis so far. Now, this is the person where, wherein the person present with spastic paralysis. Mm. Uh, you have different stages here. Like initially, the person will be the condition uh, latent. Latent wherein the person looks apparently normal. You don't find any kind of spasticity uh, unless the person is uh, exposed to physical stress. When a person is exposed to physical stress, then you, have, you can see some amount of uh, this condition. Then the person will have no stick face, though the person is having difficulty in walking, uh, short, uh, uh, suffering gait, the person will be able to manage, no stick. Later, the person will move on to one stick stage where he is unable to uh, bear himself, he is uh, not able to support himself. To, sub to have the support, he will be having one particular stick, that is called one stick stage. Eventually, the, the condition progresses wherein the person will have two stick stage wherein because of excessive bending of the knees, he is not able to balance himself. So he is using two sticks and finally he will uh, land up with clawless stage wherein he, he is not able to carry himself. Okay? So this is these are the different stages which we get in lethargism. Well, coming to the treatment options, uh, you can see like we don't have any specific antidote for this. Most of the muscle spasticity it is uh, irreversible. They say like if you give vitamin C prophylaxis for uh, uh, 500 milligram to I mean, 300 milligram to 1000 uh, milligram that is 1 gram per day for a week it they say that it tends to reverse the early feature apart from that we don't have any specific antidote we just have to give supportive measures there is another important condition that is due to this particular plant this is nothing but argimona mexicana argimon mexicana this is also called as prickly poppy, okay, Mexicana poppy and uh, it is also called as Pila Datura. Datura Pila is yellow color, no? This has got yellow color flower, so this is called as Pila Datura. It produces what is called as epidemic dropsy. The reason is you can see the seeds. On the left side, you can see black mustard seed. On the right side, you can see argimon seed. Both will look alike, very similar to that. Yeah. So sometimes there is a deliberate adulteration. Okay. For they will mix this argimon seed onto the mustard seed. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes this accidentally it is mixed with this uh, mustard seed. But the problem is this argimon seed, it contains two important toxins that is sanguinarin and dihydrosanguinarin. These are the two important things which are responsible for this epidemic drops. Okay. And what is the toxicity? Though it affects many of the organs, the primary site of uh, damage is blood vessel wherein it causes capillary damage. When it causes capillary damage, it increases leakage. So more and more fluid will be moving into the ECF and there will be leakage of uh, plasma proteins as well. It results in edema. But the problem is more vascular leakage, more fluid moving out of the vascular system. There is hypoperfusion, hypovolemia, hypoperfusion of uh, uh, kidneys. It results in stimulation of renin-angiotensin mechanism. Okay, renin-angiotensin aldosterone mechanism which in turn will stimulate sodium retention and water retention. Mm -hmm. You know very well it is a vicious cycle. Again, it will lead to exaggeration of edema. Finally, the person will land up in anasarka. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, the person will obviously have pulmonary edema, congestive cardiac failure. So these are the symptoms the person can present with. So you can see the edematous condition in the legs. Treatment option, we don't have nothing much. We just have to prevent it. You need to remove the oil from the diet and obviously you can give some antidote vitamin C or vitamin E for supporting measures. Moving on to poisonous mushrooms. See, you have numerous species of mushrooms. Less than 5% of mushroom species are toxic. Okay. But the point is how to differentiate whether it is toxic poisonous one and non-poisonous, edible and non-edible. 
If you're talking about poisonous mushrooms, so you have a big classification. It has got cyclopeptides, gyrometrin, scoprins, muscarin, hibotenic acid, psilocybin, all these are there. We will just focus on the high yield thing, the most important thing that is cyclopeptide containing mushroom. The most important species which you have to know is amanetophyloids. This is very important. Mm -hmm. Sir, e even this is the amanetophyloids where uh, they commonly call it death cap. Okay. It's called death cap because uh, owing to the potency of the toxicity of the uh, mushroom. Okay. Right. But here, even if you take uh, two to three mushrooms, it is fatal. Okay. And the problem is, even if you cook it, the toxin will not be removed. Okay. Even in cooked, it is heat stable. Even in uh, cooked food, the toxins will be there. So it is dangerous. What are the toxins you can see? Amatoxin, phyllotoxin, virotoxin. But of all these toxins, this is high, highly toxic. Amatoxin is very potent. It is fatal as well. From the name only we can... Yes, amatoxin. Amatoxin. floids and amatoxin. You can easily remember that. And what are the clinical features? The patient will into develop into three series of features. Initially, the person will have gastroenteritic feature. Then he will move on to remission for a day. Then the third or fourth day, the person will eventually land up in hepatic or renal failure. We'll discuss about that. See, gastroenteritic, as the name implies that the person will be having gastroenteritis. Yeah. So obviously, you know, what is the complication? The person will present with hypovolemia or he can present with electrolyte imbalance. This sometimes will be fatal for kids. If the children is there and the person is suffering, uh, kids are suffering from this mushroom toxicity, this kind of severe dehydration, electrolyte imbalance can be fatal. We need to be very careful. The third phase, I told you second phase is remission. The third phase, hepatic failure, the patient will present with increased ALT and ALT. Because of this hepatic injury, the patient will present with increased ALT and AST. Sometimes you can as well see increased bilirubin, okay. which will result in jaundice. The patient will be presenting with jaundice. This is in happening in phase 3? Yes, phase 3. Okay. And the person will be having hypoglycemia. They say that hypoglycemia is one of the severe, the, the factor which which implies reflects the severity of the disease that is glucose okay. and obviously you will have coagulopathy that is increased INR will be there prothrombin time will be there the person will be uh, present in you with bleeding spontaneous bleeding will be there so you need to be uh, handling that case and renal failure renal failure can present early or late early the person renal failure is due to the complication of uh, hypoperfusion we were discussing that the person will go into hypoperfusion so that can result in renal failure or else mm -hmm. due to the hepatic uh, encephalopathy or hepatic uh, failure due to the part of hepatorenal syndrome again the person can end up in renal failure mm -hmm. so what are the things to monitor first of all you need to monitor whether the person is having dehydration or not then you need to monitor electrolytes because he is prone for severe electrolyte disturbances, so you need to monitor electrolytes. You need to monitor uh, glucose. I told you the hypoglycemia is one of the severe uh, factor, and you should obviously look for this uh, coagulopathy profiles. Okay, all these things you have to monitor. When you are monitoring, obviously you can correct it. Whenever there is dehydration, you can give IV fluids, rehydrate the person, correct the electrolytes. You can give electrolytes, correct the glucose. You can give dextrose solution. And if the person is having this increased coagulopathy, you can give fresh frozen plasma to correct it. These are the supportive measures, highly important for initial management. Then how to decontaminate? Decontamination can be done by activated charcoal. You can give activated charcoal, the activated charcoal it binds to the toxin, it will get ex excreted. Suppose if the toxin is already in the system, this is one of the common antidote which we gave, benzyl penicillin. This penicillin, like they say that it increases or we can say it displaces the amatoxin from the plasma binding proteins. Mm -hmm. What happens is normally the amatoxin will be binding to the plasma protein binding sites. So what this penicillin will do is this penicillin will displace it from the site okay. so that the amatoxin will be excreted in the system. That right? most potent one, no? Yeah. And if the person is suffering from hepatic failure or renal failure, obviously you have to take care of uh, supportive measures have to be done for that. Coming to uh, other mushroom uh, toxins, like we have something called aflatoxin. Mm -hmm. Aflatoxin, uh, it is produced by fungus only. 
and we have something called uh, ergot toxicosis that is also another condition which is highly important for examinations mm -hmm. aflatoxins like it is produced by sir this is a, like uh, aspergillus flavus yes that yes, is the yes. most important one which does this aflatoxin production yes and uh, uh, regarding uh, that ergotoxicosis one mm -hmm. if you go for that is uh, the clavicis purpurea seeds yes they contaminate the edibles yes particularly and when you store this uh, wheat rice and all when the moisture content is more right you have yeah. this fungus infestation when the fungus is getting infested and it produces this uh, condition and mm -hmm. you eat that thing and you get this condition so this aflatoxin is related to hepatocellular carcinoma yeah so, yeah yeah it is very important question also frequently mm -hmm. asked that it associates with hepatocellular carcinoma, carcinoma, carcinoma. and uh, regarding sir those uh, ergotoxicosis also there was a question yes sir. and uh, that was like it presents with two like uh, weird signs like okay. scent sweetest dance okay scent and thorny's fire yes these people will be having a convulsions and involuntary movements and also St. Peter's dance and the person will be presenting with parasitia as well parasitia okay. and this you know ergotism the, the person will be having vasoconstriction mm -hmm. so he will develop peripheral gangrenes mm -hmm. so that is why they say that uh, the person will be having St. Anthony's fires disease parasitia peripheral gangrene convulsion so all these features will be seen with ergotoxicosis okay Fish consumption, you have few important toxins alone. I'll just let us restrict towards the most important one. Cicutoxin is the one which uh, causes, uh, uh, it, this is the one which causes GAT symptoms. Okay, it as well causes paresthesia. This is very important because this is where you get uh, reversal of heart and cold sensation. Reversal of hot and cold sensation, paresthesia. This is very typical for cigotoxin. And for this, you can just give amitriptylin so that paresthesia features will be controlled. Scombrotoxin. Scombrotoxin. This is again, it will cause uh, particularly histamine. Like whenever you release histamine in your body, what are the features you have got? So those features will be there. The person will be having itching, uh, trichoria pruritus, all these things will be there. And regarding this, sir, one question have come recently, like this chromoid fish poisoning associates with which particular organism? Okay. okay. So I like to tell, like th this is confused. The students are confused regarding it that uh, E. coli or Morganella. So Morganella is exclusive of it. Okay. And E. coli also does it, but uh, if both options comes, then you have to mark up the Morganella. Okay. Okay. That associates with chromoid fish poisoning, and as sir told that it is a histamine release, uh, which happens up after having this. So when, when somebody eats this decomposed fish, this morganella mm -hmm. is the one which converts the histidine okay. into histamine. Mm -hmm. And when somebody eats that, the person gets all these features. And obviously you can manage with anti-histamine. The third one... And that question is coming guys in this exam. Yeah, anti-histamine. Mm -hmm. You can say the person has eaten uh, seafood and after some time he is presenting with all these features. Uh, reversal of heat and cold sensation, you can think of cicutoxin. And the same kind of feature, uh, person heating seafoods presenting with this histamine release uh, features, you can mm -hmm. think of this scrombotoxin. But they won't be asking you what is the uh, toxin, they will be asking you what is the management. Mm -hmm. So you need to say that it is anti-histamine. Mm -hmm. Saxitoxin, shellfish, mm -hmm. we have already discussed about this, person will present with GIT features and ataxia. Tetrotoxin, this is again very important because this is the one which is due to puffer fish. This is the one which is due to puffer fish because normally in uh, people uh, they this is edible puffer fish is edible people eat this puffer fish but the only thing is the processing of this puffer fish is very delicate they say that this toxin is concentrated in the liver ovary kidneys of the fish so when they are uh, processing it for eating when they are cutting it they mm -hmm. need to remove all these things when they are not removing it properly when somebody eats puffer fish they will have obviously paralysis and paresthesia. It is very fatal. The person will present with paresthesia. The person will also present with paralysis. The person will die. It's highly fatal. Okay. That is why though it is edible, this is a very dangerous fish. Remember the name tetrodotoxin, mm -hmm. puffer fish. We have got this uh, uh, in one of the exams. Tetrodotoxin produced by puff, puffer fish. Okay, guys. Now let us assume that you are a doctor and you have got a case of food poisoning. So what are the duties you have got legally? The first thing is notifiable diseases. If the person is, uh, if the condition is mass consumption, you have so many cases from a single point source, it is a notifiable disease you need to inform to the public health authority. Preservation of high temp, this is very important both from the diagnostic point and for the forensic point. If you're talking about uh, medical legal point, the samples which you collect, 
let us say that it is a vomit test or it is foot sample or it is stool sample everything is an evidence for you you can send it for forensic science lab you can find out what it is suppose if it is homicidal imagine that it is homicidal poison okay this is a very important evidence to uh, corroborate the finding okay as i told you this is uh, uh, suppose if you are not preserving this item knowingly or unknowingly if you are losing the evidence if it leads to disappearance of evidence which is again legally punishable the person can be punished with 201 ipc okay destruction of uh, evidence disappear causing disappearance of evidence it is punishable with 201 ipc so this is from the medical legal point of view sir anything you want to add from the diagnostic point of view yeah yeah in that uh, i like to add up uh, that uh, mostly the samples will be what sir that uh, that uh, vomitus that yeah, vomitus sample stool sample or that particular food material okay so what as per the microbiology what we can do up we can demonstrate that particular toxin in them okay by various methods nowadays like uh, pcr is one of them elisa is one of them by which you can do that or we can go for the culture from them okay, okay. on the relevant uh, culture material uh, basically the problem is we have to suspect up that which yes. particular poisoning it is and that according to that we can choose up the media so from the incubation period from the signs and yeah, symptoms yeah, yeah. you need we to have a, you need mm -hmm. to first narrow down your diagnosis so that you will look specifically in that exactly exactly or we can do the direct viable counts also like uh, we can just put it on the culture plate and we can uh, look out for the organism if at all we could able to identify yes. otherwise history is of paramount importance okay. okay in that particular one so we have few more relevant sections of ipc here 272 ipc adulteration if somebody adulters any food or drink it is punishable with 272 so very common if in india very <laughs> very common in india mm -hmm. and somebody sells it knowing mm -hmm. that it is adulterated or noxious food or drink it is also punishable with 270 272 273 if somebody is fouling a water mm -hmm. it's a common source of uh, somebody is fouling a water that is again punishable with 277 we hope that it is strictly enforced mm -hmm. so that uh, at least the water sources will not be destroyed Two eighty four IPC. It is the one which gives punishment for any negligent contact with regard to any poisonous substance. This is in general for all poisons. Three twenty four. This is the section which gives punishment for causing hurt by poison. Okay, by any dangerous mean, okay. which includes poison as well. Three twenty six IPC. Voluntary causing grievous hurt. It is giving punishment for causing grievous hurt by giving poison. This is three. 26 so these are the relevant sections which you need to know so this particular chapter you can uh, this is not only important for though we so say that it is high yield area for your exams this is not only important for your exam this is also important for your practice okay so this is the food poisoning is one of the very common case which you will come across in your general practice in op so you need to know what are your duties uh, for towards the patient and towards medical legal aspect as sir have told beautifully regarding the various ipcs and all so it's a very important aspect uh, of uh, any of the doctors who is working in the emergency or anywhere you should know that uh, what all uh, it means it's not only about the food poisoning questions only so this is having a legal aspect also so that's why it is of paramount importance this particular video which is very high yield and if you go properly in a sequence and in a particular time you will have the maximum yield for your questions okay in the coming exam also and this is the way you should go for the next exam also okay so that integration your legal aspect you should know what all legal aspects are there and which all things you need to focus upon so all this you need to remember because that will help you in the future as a doctor also and uh, this will give you a particular uh, like timeline in which particular phases you have to go for what and uh, what is the history uh, like uh, in that now uh, what we have concluded from this is like it is uh, history taking is a paramount important okay you should know that uh, what you have uh, uh, like treating up so that is what is because uh, in the mbbs whenever some body tells us to take history and all how serious we are in taking history yes. nobody yes okay so this is the importance of taking history and all that uh, to differentiate the various conditions and all and uh, to treat them accordingly and obviously knowing the legal aspects also so normally we used to say by the end of history taking we need to have professional diagnosis yeah exactly uh, this professional diagnosis can be confirmed by your uh, physical examination that yeah, is yeah, what yeah. Uh, teachers usually say but sir i remember that this is the most boring thing uh, to <laughs> ask for the history and all we directly go and uh, what what happened and all like that we used to do mm -hmm. so with this uh, we come to the end of this particular video very best of luck from me all the very best
Thank you.